Stocks under some pressure this morning as the Russell bears the brunt of perhaps some yield inflicted pain. Bonds selling off again. Joining us, Brian Nick as a senior investment strategist in the Macro Institute. Brian, thanks for being here on the Schwab Network this morning. Thanks for having me. You write about the potential for risk off rally. So we're getting a little risk off. Tell me what the rally part is. What could work if we do take a little bit of a step back from all the strength the past month? Sure. So a risk-off rally tends to happen when Fed funds are close to their peak. It tends to be sort of the last throws of the bull market before you get a correction or a bear market. And it's when the S&P 500 index is still moving higher, but the leadership turns a lot more bearish. So what we're seeing now is better performance from utilities and the four sectors at the bottom of the distribution since we saw this last pop higher since mid-April have been the cyclical sector. So the example we use in our report is industrial versus utilities. That pairing is usually correlated positively with the S&P 500. Lately, though, the S&P 500 has been going up. Utilities have been dramatically outperforming industrials. That's not a bullish sign for the the, the stamina and sort of the durability of the, of the market rally from here. Mm. So uh, you're not a believer that the utilities are an AI trade? I've been uh, hearing folks say, well, this is because all the new server centers with the new robot machines are going to need fresh power. You know, buying that? Yeah, we're hearing that too. That might be some of what we're seeing, but AI has been a thing in the markets now for quite a while, at least a year, if not more. It's been one of the main drivers, secular drivers of the markets, and, and utilities only been performing well for about five weeks. It feels to us, especially in the in the in the later part of April, first part of this month, that utilities were increasingly correlated with the fact that rates were falling. So it'll be interesting to see now with rates having, as you pointed out in an earlier segment, climb back up a bit, can that utilities performance continue to, to last? Uh, or is this really just kind of a bond proxy play? That's normally what utilities are. Some of the AI stuff might be valid uh, for some investors, but utilities are, are mainly sort of a risk off defensive bond proxy play, very negatively correlated to interest rates. Okay, point made, maybe a little bit of uh, narrative fitting by the kind of AI bulls there on uh, why utilities are doing what they're doing. I'm kind of with you where generally it looks uh, like kind of a more defensive uh, type of posture, especially because there was some other stuff happening during that period too, where it just looks like the reach of uh, the NVIDIA trade is, is limited. Um, what do you make of that, the fact that stocks are down despite that company surging? Is that like dangerous concentration or is that just uh, folks kind of getting myopic and eventually the money will make its way into other stuff? So the NVIDIA story and the sort of the, the CapEx story writ large with mega cap tech is an interesting one from a macro perspective. Because when we think about macro, we normally think about inflation. We think about the labor markets, right? But this isn't something that's really touching those things necessarily. It represents one sector that's made this huge commitment to this new technology. And NVIDIA is, is benefiting from a lot of the investment that's being made and that will continue to be made. Whether that plays into the broader macro uh, story. So why would, for example, banks be rallying on better NVIDIA earnings? Why would uh, necessarily uh, material stocks or energy stocks be rallying on NVIDIA earnings? You can probably draw sort of a tangential line there. But for the most part, this is something that exists sort of off from the, the rest of the cycle. Um, when we look at the impact of interest rates, cumulative impact of interest rates, the slowdown that we think is, is underway in the labor markets, those are the much bigger stories for those cyclical stocks rather than something that's happening sort of on the CapEx side in big tech. Okay, so uh, utilities kind of leading from a sector perspective, the tech behind it largely an NVIDIA story, then where else works? Because it seems like when you move down in size, it doesn't really work. And then of course you move down in quality, that hasn't really worked for a while. So uh, where's our hideout? So we're looking at late cycle trades here because we think we're, we're, we're about to see, again, when the Fed starts cutting, a lot of times the market is kind of rooting for those Fed cuts to show up. But it's be careful what you wish for, because when the Fed starts cutting, it typically is because unemployment is rising and because the equity market is beginning to struggle or about to start. So aside from utilities, the other places you could hide out as an investor would be things like consumer staples, relatively defensive REITs. Again, when rates start falling because the economy is getting worse, it's a sort of a mixed bag for REITs, but they still tend to do better than a lot of those hyper cyclicals. Um, and, and then, you know, technology being as rate sensitive as it is and being sort of uh, glued to these more sort of secular stories, is probably not the worst performer the next time we get a bit of a downturn, although valuation is obviously a concern there. How much of valuation is a concern? Is valuation a concern, Brian, uh, no, regardless, or is it only a concern if rates 
start pressuring the market? What's that relationship like? Because it kind of looks like we're sensitive to bonds getting back to like four, five, four, six, but we've been here so many times. Should it be that way? No, we think that if investors who are worried about the next Fed speaker to come out and say something hawkish or the next inflation print uh, or the next you know bond auction are probably focused on the wrong risks here. We think over the next you know six to nine months, the biggest risk is the is the larger macro story deterioration in the labor market, not inflation, but lower rates because the economy is weakening. Uh, and in that in that kind of a story, again, you're not really worried about um, you know valuations from from a from a you know pressuring standpoint of of uh, PEs getting hit by higher rates. What you're concerned about is rates falling because of risk aversion. And that's a time when you, you know, even talking outside the equity market where you want to be in, in you know, bond portfolios and where the valuation looks most compelling right now is fixed income versus equities. We haven't seen an opportunity, let alone attractiveness in fixed income compared to the stock market really since, since the, 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 the peak in the tech bubble um, to the degree we're seeing it today. So that's something we're talking to uh, investors about a lot, especially if those who share our concern that the macro story is not going to stay rosy for that much longer. Okay. So then when you weigh the uh, risks to the market, if we divide them just into kind of simple categories of inflation, reflation risk, yields going higher, the kind of valuation pressure versus the flip side, recession risk, data softening. Now, there might arguably be a third category there that's kind of stagflation, but just kind of leaving that to the side for a second, which of the two there is, is the bigger threat uh, in your mind, Brian? So near term, it feels like the next Fed speaker is going to be marginally hawkish and the markets aren't going to like that. Okay. So again, over the balance of this year, as we head into next year, I know it's looking pretty far ahead, by far the bigger story is macro softening, higher unemployment. And then, yeah, we'll get those rate cuts, but they won't be happening in sort of the benign and rosy way that people are expecting them to. They could be happening a lot more sharply and uh, and and potentially for a prolonged period of time than, than we're, we're pricing in. Because again, if the unemployment rate is at four and a half, five percent, uh, these are not numbers that are being talked about right now. All the focus is on inflation. But if we do start to see that broader deterioration, weaker consumer, weaker GDP growth, the Fed's going to be in the market cutting, uh, not for reasons that people uh, should be looking forward to. OK, so that kind of view that even if we do cut, it's going to be for bad reasons. Uh, you know, that's not something to celebrate. The idea that we're going to cut because so we are getting immaculate disinflation seems to be getting put to bed by some of the Fed speakers. Uh, your career, you started with the Fed. What do you make? Uh, and how are you kind of reading some of the language since the minutes last week? Because it does seem like they've taken a little bit like on the margin, a slightly more hawkish tone. And that might just be Kashkari. What, what do you think? Yeah, I, it's been a long time since at the Fed, but they were they're a lot more communicative now. They're they're sharers now that in, in the sense that they weren't sort of in the Greenspan Fed in the early to mid 2000s. So you hear from a lot of these Fed presidents a lot more. And it feels like this is sort of a substitute for data. So the last couple of data points we've gotten weak retail sales, weak industrial production for April, um, not not so hot inflation for for April for CPI. We'll get the PCE number on Friday, but we're getting these Fed speakers that are sort of offsetting those kind of more softer, maybe more dovish data points with more data dependent, you know, sort of leaning towards hawkish rhetoric. And the thing I'd point out is last June, the FOMC had forecast core PCE to be 2.6% in 2024 and had forecast four rate hikes. We're going to get at least that low inflation this year. 2.6% is about where we are now, maybe a tick or two above it. We're going to get that this year, and we're not going to get four rate cuts if you're listening to the FOMC. So they're not just data dependent. Their reaction function has also changed here as well, and it can easily change back. Mm. When you frame it like that, it might even argue that uh, maybe we should be thinking about hiking if in, uh, inflation. If When you say that you know they're going to react, uh, I should be clear, then if things warm up, should there be a non-zero probability of hikes if the inflation go the other way? Because right now the market's basically been so focused on one outcome. Is there a possibility that, uh, you know, the data dependency cuts to the upside, too? I think the Fed feels like they're getting a little bit of a free lunch by going out and saying things like maybe, yeah, maybe there's a 5 percent chance we're going to hike or not completely taking off the table, even though the chairman basically did take it off the table. Subsequently, the Fed presidents and the governors have come in and, and put it back on the table. I think the Fed feels like it can get away with that as long as the labor market is strong and they don't feel like they're paying a price for it. They're looking at these you know, financial conditions indexes that indicate that things have been easing up, right? We have tight credit spreads. We have an equity market that's close to all time highs. So I think they feel like they're, again, they're, they're, they're able to do that kind of thing to kind of keep 
investors honest to keep the markets honest. But I think if you were kind of give them all the truth serum, they would say that there's you know there's no way they're going to be hiking uh, rates. There's just we know kind of downstream what's going to be impacting inflation in the next couple of months. It's going to be uh, softer rent inflation. It's going to be softer used car prices. We, those things are already baked in the pie, and so we are going to see um, not 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 just a a kind of a pause, but I think we're going to see a further uh, disinflation. And they're just kind of. It feels like they're just sort of doing a tap dance until that arrives. Okay. Uh, so while they're tap dancing, we look for late cycle trades and we uh, don't look the gift horse in the mouth. We are happy to take four and a half percent or more on our, uh, you know, CDs and stuff. Uh, fair enough. Yeah, it doesn't feel like the, the most exciting uh, investment recommendation, but we think that's that's prudent. I mean, if you're going to go out even further, we do think that that longer term bonds will be a ballast against a downturn and that's got come into some question but we do feel like rates are above neutral and are certainly above where they would be in a recession so if you're looking for something that's going to perform well in a recession probably not going to find it in the equity market in an absolute sense you're going to have to look at fixed income okay so bonds kind of uh work in two out of three scenarios uh one where okay even if you don't get principal gain you lock in your four and a half five or whatever uh and then if things do get ugly then they help to hedge stocks like it. Brian, great stuff, uh, very helpful and sound framework. Thanks for your time, Brian Nick, Senior Investment Strategist at Macro Institute.